thanks for joining us here today at Victory Church, where we invite people to belong before they believe. If you wanna know more about who we are and what we do, or if any of our messages have impacted your life and you would like to partner with us in giving to this ministry, we invite you to do so by visiting our website at victory.church. Now, let's check out this week's message. Well, welcome Victory Church. How are we doing today? I wanna welcome our Edmond campus, our Great campus. Those of you online, we are so grateful for you and thankful uh, that you're here today. And uh, real, really quick, that event that, that you heard talked about earlier um, transformed. We actually, um, it's going to be happening at the Edmond campus, and I'm really excited about it, and here's why. We already actually had this event at the Grapevine campus where I'm at now, and it was incredible to see the transformation that just took place in people's lives. And what was, what was really neat for me was that we had all generations represented, okay? So we had people that have been following God for a very long time that you think they've already had all the transformation they need. And the truth is that's never the case, right? We can always grow closer to God. And so whether you need inner healing, whether you just need um, encouragement, a next step is to, t is to sign up for this event. So I'm excited about it. Um, man, I wanna do something real quick. I am so grateful for our lead pastor, Pastor John and his wife, Michelle. Can we thank God for them? We're so grateful for you, Pastor John. And um, our church is in a really neat place. You know, I get the perspective because I'm at the, I'm at the um, Grapevine campus, but I used to be at the Eben campus. And from time to time, I get to hang out with you rowdy people here at Oklahoma City. But I get to see just the way the Lord is working. And really neat uh, perspective is this. We have campuses, like I said, in, in Grapevine and Edmond and, and here, obviously. And, and um, just recently, so we only launched the Grapevine campus, um, really, I mean, it's been just a little over a year. And uh, give you a perspective, three weeks ago, I think we had around 300 people there total. And then the weekend after that, la not, la not this weekend, but last weekend, we had almost 500 people. And so God is just, he is just growing the church. And Pastor John talks about this all the time. It's not about growing big churches, it's about growing big people. But what we find is when we grow big people, it actually grows big churches. And so I'm just so grateful for our lead pastor and the way that he's leading our church. He's just recently taken us through Live, Move, Be. Our mission statement, to live in his presence, to move beyond ourselves, and to be transformed. And I wanna, I wanna follow that mini season up with a message that I think really follows it well. In fact, we find it in Psalm 1, 1 through 3. Here's what it says. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates, say meditates, who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, say it with me, prospers. I want to prosper. How many of you want to prosper? I want to talk to you today. The title is this, Prosperous Planting. The word prosper can be a trigger word for people in the church at times, can it? Because there, over the years, there's been this, this picture, this picture of what it really means to prosper in the word. And the truth is this, though. Although man has confused that at times, and maybe it's been preached in ways that, that um, is maybe not fully accurate, the truth is that the Lord wants you to prosper. He does. He wants you to prosper in your relationships. He wants you to prosper in your marriages. He's got a design for your life, and, it, and he says he's got the plans for you, and plans for good, to, to give you a hope and a future. Like he's got a, a process and a plan for your life, but he does want you to prosper. And so what I wanna talk about today is this prosperous planting. This prosperous planting. There's, there's a sequential steps that I wanna take you through that the, the Lord showed me. It's possible. The first step is this, is in the seed, there is possibility. 
in the seed, there is possibility that there is a seed. I've got a seed right here. This is a mustard seed. It's so tiny. It's one of the smallest seeds, right? But in this seed right here, there is possibility. The possibility is if, if I put this seed in the right environment and I, I, I put this seed in good soil and I, I take care of this seed, it's, the right, it's, it's, you know, it's watered and it finds its nutrients, this seed has the potential, the possibility of becoming what? A tree. A tree. And the truth is, the, the word of God has possibility. In fact, it, it, it talks about the word being a seed. Check this out. We're, I'm going to look at Luke 8. Now, this is the parable of the sower. Many of you have read this before, and you've heard this before. You've heard this preached before. This is the parable of the sower. This is the, the farmer who's scattering some seed. It says some fell, he was basically is talking about some fell on the path, and some fell on rocky ground, and some fell among thorns. Then when you get to verse 11, he begins to unpack this. So just like Jesus not, does so many times in Scripture, he's, he's preaching to and talking to a crowd of people, and then all of a sudden, he gets back with his disciples, and they begin to ask questions, and he digs in a little bit deeper with his disciples, and that's what's happening in verse 11, starting in verse 11. It says this. This is Jesus talking. He said, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. There's no root system. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns are for those who hear, but they go on their way and they are, cho they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and a good heart who hear the word and retain it. Say retain it. Who hear, I need you to get this. There's an important part here. To hear the word and they retain it and by persevering produce a crop. This seed left in this little container right here will do nothing. This seed will not realize its potential. There is no possibility if it stays here. But the minute I take this seed and I plant it in good soil, all of a sudden that seed becomes possible. The same is true in the word of God. To hear the word and just to, to read the word and not do anything with the word and not allow yourself to plant the word, it will absolutely do nothing in your life. I, in fact, I, I remember a story from when I was a, I was a freshman in high school. And I, I, I played soccer in, in high school and I, I, uh, I actually made the varsity team and so I was so excited. I made the varsity team and I remember the very first time we're going on a road trip and we're load the bus and I'm nervous like any freshman, right? And so I, I'm in my seat, we're kind of driving, and now I didn't grow up in church. Didn't grow up in church, didn't grow up in a youth ministry, and, but I actually grew up in a home where my dad loved, loved the Word, and so he would talk about it with us, and so he kind of was planting some seeds within us, and, and, uh, and so I remember I was on this bus ride, and there was this junior guy behind me. Now, this is one of those smart intellectual guys. Anybody, anybody like that? You're a smart intellectual you're not welcome here in Victory Church. We just don't like you very much. We like average people. Jerry, very average people here is what we like. And uh, I'm kidding. You're always welcome here. We just are jealous of you. But I look back at this junior, and, uh, and he's reading the Bible. And this was, I, I didn't even think about this until last night, but outside of my dad, he's the only person I'd ever seen by this point read the Bible. And so I'm, I'm looking at this guy, and I, I look back at him, and I said, man, you, so you're a Christian. He goes, no, I'm not. And I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> There's a lot of books you could be reading. He goes, you know, he said, no, I'm not a Christian. He said, um, I love literature. The Bible's a really good story, but it's not true. Now, I don't know if this guy's a Christian now. I hope he is, but... I thought to myself, and this has stuck with me 
my whole life, and, and as I've been a pastor, this has really stuck with me because I thought to myself, and I remember kind of arguing with him, even though I didn't read the word myself, my dad had kind of planted some seeds in us, and I, I remember getting really frustrated with this guy. And I thought to myself, and I still, I still, it still sticks with me because I'm like, how in the word could someone read the word and then not do, have this transformative work that we know that the word can have in our lives? Because when we, it's not just about reading the word, people. It's not just about hearing the word. It's about doing something with the word. It's about retaining the word. It's about meditating on the word. In fact, Matthew 17, Matthew 17 says, 1720 says, he replied, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have, you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. The word has so much possibility. There's so much that the word can do for our lives, but we have to plant the word. We have to plant it. Psalm 1, 2, whose delight is in, is in, in the law of the Lord and who meditates on it. See, meditation is a difference that my friend didn't have. He was, it was, he was just reading the word. He wasn't meditating on the word. When you meditate the word, it's like taking this seed, and it's like putting it in good soil, and it's like watering it and allowing it to grow. That's what meditation is. It's taking the word from here, from a knowing to a knowing. From I've heard it to, man, it's transforming me. It's putting it in action. It's to believe it's true. It's to, see, see, faith is the activation of God's word. It's putting God's word into, into action. It's taking a word in season and, and, and speaking it over your situation. It's, it's getting a word while you're reading it in the word, and all of a sudden it says something to you and meditating on it and applying it to your life. I'm just telling you, when you do that, the word becomes active and alive. The word's talked about as a sword, a double-edged sword, separating very bone from marrow, flesh from spirit. It has a way of doing something, but it can't just be something that we read. It's got to be something that we live. It's got to be something that we plant, something that we meditate on. Meditation brings fresh revelation. And many, uh, many people, they're, they're Christ followers are walking around and they're, they're living off of last year's produce, last year's crop, and the Lord wants to give you fresh revelation, but that's going to come as you meditate. Revelation comes through meditation on God's Word, getting it in you. See, the, the anointing is on the Word and when the word is in you, then the, you have the, the anointing is there, and God wants to do something. He wants to give you that revelation, but it's always going to align with his word. Have you ever heard someone say, they got a revelation from God, and you're like, I'm not sure your revelation matches the word of God because it's not planted. Revelation is never going to contradict the word of God. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we planting? We're planting fear, worry, doubt, confusion, or we're planting his word. Matthew 13, 22 says, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of life. This is Matthew, a, a different gospel, same, same parable. It says, the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it fruitful. I'm going to really quickly talk about these two things, worries and wealth. I mean, you know that worry spread. Man, worry, you get around someone who's worrying all the time, and all of a sudden you find yourself, well, you weren't even worried until you met with this worrier. You've been there before, it's like everything was good, and then you sit down with this person, it's like, I'm worried about everything right now. <laughs> worry spread, and, and it's like weeds, you know what I'm saying? It's like, have you ever had, I like a nice lawn, anybody like a, a nice lawn like I do? Come on. Come on, lawn people. There's like three of us. Everybody else says, you need some lawn work. <laughs> I've recently, in the last year, we moved to Texas, and I went from a Bermuda lawn to a St. Augustine. And St. Augustine is beautiful, but I have no idea how to maintain it. It's driving me crazy. But I came from this beautiful, I left the last, the person I sold the house to, I left them this beautiful lawn. 
I mean, I worked so hard at this lawn. I was, I, uh, in fact, I had the nicest lawn in the neighborhood. My neighbors didn't take care of their lawn, so they allowed my light to shine just a little bit brighter than theirs. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Glory to God. I would drive in the neighborhood and be like, I can't, look at that person's lawn. What are, what are they doing? Oh, and it's like the, the angels, the light would shine upon my lawn. Amazing. I used to extra, use extra fertilizer on the, the spot that divided my lawn to their lawn. And I would mow that with such a straight line, and I called that the line of domination. <laughs> but one season, I'm dealing with this, these weeds. I mean, we had a bad winter, and, and all these weeds are popping up. And I'm telling you, it was driving me crazy. And so I had an acre at that time, and I'm on my hands and knees trying to pick weeds. And I was like, this ain't going to work. So I got weed killer, and the weed killer wasn't really working. And I talked to the lawn expert at one point, and he said, no, just, just don't worry about it. Continue to, to treat it, but all you need to do is continue to fertilize. See, if you, if you get your lawn really thick, there's no space for any weeds. This is the way that the word works in our lives. The worries of this world, you know what they do? They plant a seed of unbelief. And if you continue to allow yourself to worry and you worry and you worry and you worry and you worry, all of a sudden, it's not that maybe you don't believe in God, but you don't trust his word. And when you get the word and you plan it and you meditate on it, it's very difficult to worry about things. It begins to choke it out. It talks about wealth. And now wealth in itself is not a bad thing. It says in Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. It's the deceitfulness of wealth. Here's what it does. It, it, it just kind of gets to a place where, oh, things are okay right now. Bills are okay. Things are okay. And it plants a seed of self-reliance. I just, in season, you don't just, you find yourself just not reading the word as much. You find yourself not praying as much. Things are just kind of going okay. Both choke the word. Both say, I don't need you, God. I don't trust you, God. We have to be people who, I'm telling you, we get the word and we get, it, we get, we, we get it so thick. There's no space in our minds. There's no space in our hearts for worry to exist. And I'm not saying a little worry is going to come. I'm not trying to beat everybody down. I worry myself at times. But if we will find a word in due season, God, you take care of the birds of the air. You're going to take care of me. Tomorrow has enough worries of its own. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to take care of today. I'm going to trust you with today. I'll, I'll, I'll care about that tomorrow when I get there, and I'll do that with you, Lord. Having a word for the worry. We've got to take the, our worries to the word. You know, I, uh, I think this is why it's really important that we have our prophetic teams and our and our prayer teams, because that's why we have them here, is that, listen, when you're, when you're in a, a season where you need something, you need a word, listen, we have a prophetic team that's available for you, and that word's going to bring encouragement, hope. If you're struggling with something, we have a prayer team that's available to you at all of our locations that's going to be able to pray with you and, and take you back to the word. Sometimes we need, to, we need to lean on someone else's faith at times, and that's okay. But we have to, we have to do something with our worry. I remember at the Eben campus, a few years ago, uh, there was a lady, sweet lady, um, incredible family. She was diagnosed with cancer. And this particular Sunday, Pastor John had preached a great message and had done an altar call like he'll do from time to time. And I remember um, all these people kind of flooded the altar. And, uh, and I got up on stage and we're, worship's kind of going on and I'm about to close out the, the gathering at that time. And I, I remember... Um, just looking up and seeing her, and like the word just, the Lord just dropped a word in me, and I shared it. I said, listen, this will not end in pain, but this is going to end in a testimony. And it's just to see, listen, she's cancer-free now. Now, listen, it's not, it's not what I said. I only, I only spoke the word over her life, but that word provoked hope. Listen, hope's a powerful thing, and if you need prayer, you gotta, sometimes if you can't find that yourself, 
you got to go to somebody else, and we got to get with people to help get the word in us. Because in the seed, the word of God, there is possibility. In impossible situations, all of a sudden, become possible with the word of God. Can we thank God for that today? So in the seed, there's possibility. Second thought, you're not going to like this one as much. In the soil, there is a process. I like prosper. I don't like pro any process people, like analytical people. We don't like you guys very much. I like process without. I like prosper without process. But the process is so important. In fact, check this out. Let's read the Psalm one one through three again. Our foundational verse: Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit when? In season. And whose life does not wither, whatever they do prospers. In season. There's a season for planting, there's a season for yielding, and there's a season for growing, prosperous planting requires a process. Requires a process. See, the word of God is, is a seed and our heart is the soil and God wants to do something with our hearts. God wants to cultivate some things in our hearts. God wants to till up hard ground in the soil of our hearts. I love it when I, when I see older people in our church that have not given up the process of allowing God to cultivate their hearts. Because this process never stops. And along the process, yeah, we yield and there's crops in season, but this process never stops. God always wants to take us one step closer. That's why we're having the transformed event. God always wants to do something with you. He wants to do something in you. He wants to prepare you for the next season, but there's a process that takes place. There's something that God wants to do. And, and I'm thinking of, a, there's a guy, I can think of people right here in Oklahoma City and, and Grapevine, there's a guy in the Edmond campus named David Boyce. What I love about David is he's a guy that always takes the word and he allows it to always do work. He's always sending me these, these text messages and these, these things every Friday on Sabbath. He's always sending me these things of sharing how the Lord is working in him, how he's allowing the, the Lord and he's vulnerable and he shares how the, the Lord is tilling up some things and, and shaping him. Man, that is, that's how we have to be. we got to always continue to grow. The seed is as best, that God is doing its best work. The seed, listen, this seed is doing the most important work when it's under the soil. Where nobody can see it. God sometimes does his best work. When you're under the soil, in the dark place, where it feels like you're by yourself, and nobody sees what God's doing, because it's not about them, it's about you. Listen, it takes a deep root system to bear the weight of the tree. Before there's ever fruit, there's got to be some roots going deep. And I remember a specific time in my life, when I was in college and I began to really follow the Lord and I was walking out of a pretty sinful life and I, I was done. And I remember I didn't have, all my friends were incredible people, but, but they, didn't, they weren't walking this journey with me. And so I remember I spent many nights by myself in a dark apartment. I didn't have my light on and I parked in a different apartment complex because I did not want them to know that I was actually home. I didn't want them beating on my door and tempting me to go out with them. So I'd be by myself with worship just barely on where no one else could hear it, and I'd be reading my word. And I did that for six to eight months by myself. I'm telling you, that season in my life, has, I believe, is the reason why I'm here today in this season. This is the crop of a season of laying down roots. And maybe, the, maybe you're in a season right now where it feels like it's dark and it feels like it's empty. I'm just telling you, let the word do its work. Let the process do its work. Get in the word, meditate on it, plan it. There's, there's something down the road, but like I said, 
the tree and the fruit that God wants to produce in your life cannot bear it unless there's a deep root system. Let the, let the roots grow deep. Let them grow. I, uh, I love Pastor John's recent message, Little by Little. Listen, it's incremental, purposeful progress that over time creates the big change in our lives. It's little by little. The, some, of the best, some of the best things in our life come little by little. God doing little work and little work and little work and little work and little work. Right decision. Mess up. Pick myself up. Get back in the Word. Little by little by little. And I turn back around. I'm like, wow, God, look how far you've brought me. It's over time. It's a process. I, uh, yeah, I, I, I was thinking about this particular part of the verse where it says that that person is like a tree planted by streams of water. Listen, the environment matters to where the seed is planted. You don't take a mustard seed and plant it in the wrong environment. It won't do anything. And this is why it talks about streams of water because the root system follows nourishment. It follows the water. This tree could find water even in a season where there is no rain. I was thinking about this for the body of Christ, and I felt like the Lord said this to me. I felt like the Lord said, we have a lot of transplant Christians right now. And here's what I mean by that. A tree transplanted, taking a tree that's already got its root system and growing, but you want to take that same tree and you want to put it over here. You know what you do? You, you dig it up and you cut the root system and you ball up those roots and you take it to another place. And here's what's happening in the body of Christ in the last four or five years is that the, the enemy has tried to trick us that we replace community with spiritual consumption. You can get, you can get the best sermons in the world on your phone before you, you could be tired of me preaching right now. You can be listening to somebody better than me. True. I'm telling you right now, you can find it all over the place. There, are, there is, there's a word everywhere you turn, but there's very little community. I'm telling you, this is why it's really important to us to get people serving on the dream team. Yeah, we, we, we need your help here, but it's more about you. This is why we say we grow best in circles to get out of rows and into circles because we just believe, listen, there's something about getting face-to-face -face with people around us in community because the environment matters. we got to get around other people. That's why we have youth ministry for your kids to get into the youth ministry and get around other students and get with leaders who can walk them along this journey. And, and we have kids ministry where, listen, we believe it's, we, we want to help every generation grow one step closer to Christ. And I'm not trying to convince you to, to plant yourself in Victory Church. I'm just saying you got to plant yourself somewhere. We can't be transplant Christians that's getting one sermon here and one sermon here and one sermon here. There's no accountability in that. But there's something about getting with other people planted in the local church, a Bible-believing, Holy Spirit-filled church. That when you get around other people, I'm telling you, that's where growth can begin to happen. And they can pick you up, and you need a little nourishment because you're dry right now, and they can bring nourishment to you. Because where you're planted, it matters. We're created for community. So in the seed, there's possibility. In the soil, there is a process. Point three, in the produce, there is a purpose. And no, I didn't use fruit because it doesn't have a P. Produce. In the produce, there's a purpose. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners take or sit in company with mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of waters, which yields its fruit. That's the purpose of a fruit tree. A fruit tree is purposeless if it doesn't yield fruit. As Christ ours, we are called to yield fruit. John 15, 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. I am the vine. John 15, 5, 8. 
I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you remain in me, a planting, remaining, retaining. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away. And whither such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done to you. This is to my Father's glory that you may bear how much? Much fruit. And then it says this, I love this, showing yourselves to be not disciples. The proof is in the produce. If you're connected to the vine, you're going to bear fruit. It's the natural byproduct of being connected to the Father is that you bear fruit because you're connected in Him. You remain in Him. So when you remain in Him, you get His fruit. What kind of fruit? Well, it's in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. Listen, a seed's whole purpose is to regenerate, to become a tree that would become a vine that would bear fruit so they could bear more fruit. That's the whole purpose in a fruit tree. My, uh, my grandmother um, used to tell me this story about my grandfather. And she said, he was crazy. He was kind of crazy. He was awesome. And uh, I get a lot of my personality from him. So now you know my grandpa. He was, he was a wild man. One, uh, one season, he liked watermelon. So one season, he, um, he took this big thing of compost and he buried this whole watermelon. And my grandma was like, you're crazy. What are you doing? And she used to tell me the story. She said, there were so many watermelons, we had to give them away to people. I was thinking about that the other day. I thought, man, isn't that the way the fruit of the Holy Spirit is? You have so much joy that you give it away to people. Listen, you have so much peace that you can't help but give them a watermelon. They get your peace because you've got peace. And so you walk into your business and your, you know, and your employees get peace. Or you walk into your, your, your place of work and you sit at your cubicle and people all around you get peace. And they try to throw worry at you and you give them back peace. This is the purpose in our, our fruit. It's, it's, yes, it's for us, but it's also for others. They can be nourished by your fruit of the Holy Spirit. Listen, people all day long can argue the Word of God, but they cannot argue what God has done in your life. They cannot argue what the Word has done. When you take it, you retain it, you plant it, you meditate on it, it produces fruit. I'm just telling you, they can't argue when the Word brings you peace. You know what the Word says? That you have the peace that passes what? All understanding. You don't know why. They don't know why. You just got peace. Why? Because it's not, that's not, Listen, joy is not, is not happiness. Listen, says, the word says joy is the fruit of the Spirit. And it also says that joy is our strength. In a difficult situation, you can be joyful. There's a lady at the Grapevine campus who just lost her husband. Incredible lady, older lady. And I'm just telling you, I want to be like her when I grow up. Her name's Jenny Elder. She has so much joy. Yeah, she's going through, it doesn't mean we don't go through difficulty. It just means that we have a fruit of the Spirit. When we stay connected to the vine, we get things that the world says we should not have. Joy in the midst of pain. Peace when we shouldn't. Self-control when we don't want to. I'm just telling you, it, it, it's, a, it's a byproduct of staying close to the vine. So in the seed, there's possibility. In the soil, there's a process. In the produce, there's a purpose. And point four. I love this. I love when the word opens up like this. Through the seed, there is a promise. Check this out. Two scriptures 
come together really cool for me. Galatians 3.16, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scriptures did not, does not say into seeds, meaning many people, but into your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. That Jesus Christ was a seed that God sent. And what do, what do seeds do? They regenerate new life. So I was earlier saying the word is the seed. Is it Jesus or is it the word? Well, check this out. John 1, 1 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That Jesus was a seed. He was the word. He was the word. That when God was talking to Abraham and said, listen, all these generations from your, from your seed, is, all these generations are going to lead to one person, and that is Jesus Christ, who I'm sending as a seed to regenerate new life in broken and dead people. Where sin entered this world and separated us from God, God had a plan. He said, Jesus is coming, and he's going to bring new life. And those who believe in him and plant that in their hearts, all of a sudden, a heart of stone becomes a heart of flesh. A dead life becomes a new life. A purposeless life becomes a purposeful life. A dead past becomes a new future. I'm just telling you, listen, that's what, that's what this is all about, is a relationship with Jesus. And my friend, many years ago, that read a Bible and said it's the greatest story ever written, had, he was right about one thing, he was wrong about the other. He was right that it was the greatest story ever written. He was wrong that it wasn't true. Because God loved you so much that in all your brokenness, in all your mistakes, past, present, and future, would go up on a cross when Jesus would hang upon it And he would die a sinner's death, even though he was sinless. And he'd become the forgiveness and the salvation for you and I. With nobody looking around, if you're here today, you'd say, that's me. Or you're, here, you're there at Edmund or Grapevine or online, you say, that's me. Or maybe you say this, I, I've prayed that prayer at one point in my life and I have veered and I've gone astray like the prodigal son, and today I want to return to the Father. If that's you, any of those two situations, if that's you, nobody look around. Would you, at all, your, all of our campuses, would you lift your hand right now and say, that's me today. Today I want to make Jesus Christ my Lord and my Savior. Today I want the forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ. Right back out here to my left, can we welcome this person to the family of God? Who else? Who else? Say, that's me. That's me. Today, I want to make Jesus Christ my Lord and my Savior. I want to be forgiven of the sin that separates me from God. And today, I want new life, new life regenerated in me. Anybody else? You say, that's me. Right back here, I see you. I see you. God sees you. Can we welcome this person? Right over here. Two over here to my left saying yes. We welcome these people. Who else? Over here, I, over here, I see you. Yes, that's what I'm talking about, saying yes to Jesus. Who else? Who else just asked me? Right here, I see you. I see you. Yep, I see you in the back. I see you there. Man, and more importantly, it's not about me seeing you. It's about God seeing you. It's about your heart crying out to the heart of a father who loves you and cares for you so much. So I want you to say a prayer after me, and I want you to say this from your heart to the heart of the Father. Say, Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for me, to die for my sin. Come into my life. I choose today to follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Thank you for joining us here today for this week's message. And here at Victory Church, we are called to equip people to live in His presence, move beyond ourselves, and be transformed. And this can only happen through your radical generosity, your serving, and your prayers. 
If this message or any of our messages have impacted your life and you would like to partner with us by giving into this ministry, you can do so by visiting our website at victory.church give. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.